for a fantastic first panel. The title is Where Best to Invest Your Capital Today. Uh, on the panel, we have John Kustas, who's president and CEO of Danaos Corporation, Petros Papas, chief executive officer of Star Bulk Carriers Corporation, Jerry Calariatos, uh, CEO and director at Capital Product Partners, Leon Patitsas, founder and CEO of Atlas Maritime, Elias Sakelis, partner and chief investment officer, Borealis, and uh, moderating. One more across before that thing. Can you do it again? Oh, I think you don't understand this one. And moderating a man of many talents, um, uh, Mr. Harry Vafias, CEO Stealth Gas. Harry, please. Good morning, everybody. Um, first of all, I'd like to congratulate um, Marine Money for its uh, 25th. Uh, uh, annual uh, Greek uh, anniversary. We hope uh, many more to come. Uh, we have uh, a very interesting uh, group of uh, people here. Uh, I'm sure you know all of them, with uh, each with its uh, own background and uh, expertise uh, in uh, dry, in containers, in uh, gas, in tankers, in uh, mixed fleets. A bit of everything, so it's. Uh, I'm very lucky to be moderating uh, this panel. It's the first time I moderate, so excuse me if I'm not uh, up to up to standards. Um, so we have a few questions, and um, uh, I'll ask certain uh, speakers to answer. And of course, in the end, if we have uh, questions uh, from the audience, uh, if we have time, we'll take some questions. Um, Okay, so I mean, in today's environment where we have uh, gas doing very well, uh, containers did very well still in decent uh, levels, dry actually improving quite a bit, tankers do have done extremely well now a bit um, slower. Obviously, the million dollar question is, um, where to invest and if it's the right time to, to invest. So I'll start with uh, Petros, who's first in line, if you want to give us some comments on this. Thank you, Harry. Why are you starting with me? I spilled, I spilled coffee on my, on, my, uh, on my jacket this morning. Didn't yes, start well. Did so I, we were starting what did I tell you about the coffee? Say. <laughs> Say what uh, he said that uh, that means that the capes are going to be getting forty thousand dollars a day. Okay, so if they do, only. if they do, I want a commission. Eh? <laughs> yeah, I knew you were driving at that. <laughs> well, where to invest? Um, if you allow, if you allow me, I will also talk about uh, other other sectors rather than uh, dry right. Well, I think I think I would not I would not invest right now in container ships because there's a big order book, um, and I always looked at uh, container ships as an oligopoly. Of course, these oligopolies got um, prisoners of the market couple of years ago, nobody expected that the COVID would have such an effect. So a lot of money was made. Bravo, Yanni. Congratulations. Um, but right now, I would wait on that sector. On the tanker side, uh, I'm more positive than you are, but uh, they're already expensive. On the dry side, I don't think anything spectacular is going to happen. Um, unless, unless if the war in Ukraine uh, stops, then I think we will see rebuilding and uh, major congestion, and that would be good for the market. Um, on the gas world, I'm not the right person to talk about. They're expensive vessels, and we don't have the expertise. So right now, I would stay patient. I would not invest in shipping. I would wait to see where things go because we are in a difficult um, 
period as well. We don't know what kind of uh, fuels we will be using in the future. So I would s uh, stay on the sideline mostly and wait. And maybe invest a little bit in real estate in Greece. I think uh, this is going to have the best uh, return on investment actually going forward. Thank you, Pedros. I guess I can forget my commission. Yanis. <laughs> uh, Thank you. First of all, I'd like to congratulate you on your new endeavors. We hope that we will see the... Uh, Unfortunately, you live in the South. Yeah, well, <laughs> it's okay. I may invest, uh, you know, as Petro suggested, in the North <laughs> <laughs> on the basis, uh, let's say, of your involvement. Your building permit will be done in uh, no time. Yes, yeah, I hope it's going to take <laughs> less than Spetsas, you know. Uh, yeah, in terms of investment, uh, well, in containers, uh, yes, there is uh, a lot uh, of order book. <coughs> on the other hand, yeah, on the other hand, don't forget that uh, in, in the container sector, it's the most sensitive to the price of fuel and the price of carbon, which is coming now into the equation. And uh, that means that new technology in container ships uh, is having a much larger effect compared, let's say, to the other slow-going vessels like bulkheads and tankers. Uh, so, yes, of course, the order book does not give you, uh, let's say, the confidence to move in a big way. Uh, however, uh, we are uh, in still investing in this market with new buildings, which of course we are trying to future-proof uh, by having them uh, methanol ready. And uh, we definitely see that there is uh, considerable interest uh, purely, you know, if you work down the economics on uh, the uh, differential in uh, consumption. Uh, again, in the other sectors, yes, in shipping, uh, it, we know it's a cyclical business, so uh, you have to invest really when you see that uh, you, know, you are in the low part of the cycle of a certain sector, and we believe that dry bulk is in the low cycle. Maybe it's not, let's say, as low as it has been other times, but still definitely well below average. Uh, I agree with uh, Petros. We do not see very much happening, uh, let's say, within, I would say, the whole of 24, uh, because, you know, China, the way that also we experience it through the container ships, is not going to recover, uh, you know, anytime soon. Uh, tankers, yes, it's an interesting sector, but currently, uh, you know, overvalued. And uh, so definitely it's a mistake to enter at the top of the cycle in a certain place. Uh, gas. It's a very interesting uh, sector. Uh, actually, gas uh, has uh, a lot of uh, similarities with uh, container ships because you know it's a type of asset that, in general, you do not operate spot. It's the type of asset that you lock in into long-term uh, periods, which gives you a lot of uh, visibility in your earnings. Uh, on the other hand, what exactly is going to happen in the future, it's very difficult uh, to tell. Uh, overall, yes, I would agree with Petros. It's uh, a period that one should not take uh, any significant risks. Of course, you cannot just stay put. You will have to look around. Uh, uh, investment in uh, decarbonization whether in terms of, uh, let's say, refitting the ships to minimize uh, 
their consumption and improve their performance uh, is a process that we are very actively embarking. Uh, and also, uh, there are various interesting uh, technologically, uh, let's say, advanced carbon capture projects that uh, the industry is pursuing, which I believe they may have a significant impact into the uh, new IMO rules. Thank you, Yanni. Um, Jerry, you have had a quite an exciting time uh, ordering a new uh, type of uh, new buildings, let's say. Um, can you say a few words about it? Uh, absolutely. Um, I think this is one of the most difficult shipping markets to, to read for quite a while. You have, I mean, the, the traditional approach of um, investing at low points when it comes to asset prices does not apply here, right? Across uh, all shipping segments, we have um, above average uh, asset prices, uh, be it uh, secondhand or new builds. On the other hand, we have a number of uh, other factors. In certain segments, dry bulk and tankers, we have historically low water books. Um, and at the same time, very limited shipyard capacity, especially for larger ships, whereby you can see that if you order a ship today, um, there is um, little that can change the order book for the next three or four years, which has not been typically the case. In addition to that, because of the whole um, uh, decarbonization discussion, uh, many people have been uh, taking a back seat and not, uh, not going forward with, um, uh, with orders. And uh, that, question mark about what's the, the fuel of the future, what are the fuels of the future, is very much in everybody's mind. So uh, there is there are so many diff different factors and different uh, underlying markets that I think this is uh, probably uh, one of the most challenging markets. Um, what we have done um, is firstly, we believe very much in the gas segment. And the reason that we believe in the gas segment is shipyard capacity there is very limited. Secondly, there are barriers to entry, but for me, supply alone does not make markets. Demand is what uh, typically would make a market. And then you look at the liquefaction capacity that it's coming online between 2026, 2028, and you see that despite the sizable order book that you have for LNG carriers, for example, which is almost 50% of the current fleet, um, all those vessels are just the vessels that these new projects need. So there is no, um, no space for replacement, no space for, um, uh, for removal of the less efficient ships like steamships and TFTs or new uh, projects that are t taking FIDs right now. So this is, um, this is a, a segment where uh, we see very good fundamentals. But having said that, we have seen also uh, asset prices move uh, by almost um, uh, 80 to $90 million over the last three, four years in terms of uh, new building prices. Now, um, the, the other um, aspect of what we have done, and this is what you referred to, is that we have decided to also invest in, uh, firstly, vessels that are already um, equipped to deal with uh, the immediate needs of decarbonization. So, and when we thought about it, you know, in the end there is, uh, there are going to be many fuels around and uh, I'm sure we will discuss this uh, as well. But if you want to be able to have um, the most efficient um, um, vessel today with uh, the smaller carbon footprint, there is very little other than um, LNG dual fuel that can get you there. And I mean with, uh, a competitive uh, fuel in terms of pricing that is readily available and there is the infrastructure to find it. So we have invested in tankers that uh, are dual fuel LNG tankers. And we believe through the market-based measures that are being introduced such as the EU EPS, uh, Fuel EU and others, the return um, is actually going to be, um, it looks quite promising. Let's, let's see how this all pans out. And especially if market-based measures are introduced more widely. And the other thing that we have done is that we decided that we want to be part of the new trades that emerge because of the green economy. Now, we're talking about global decarbonization, not shipping decarbonization. So we have invested in very large ammonia carriers, uh, which uh, are going to play a role in the transportation of green ammonia, um, which is uh, expected to be used in power generation, especially in the East. Japan and Korea are uh, the main candidates right now. 
And the other key uh, trait has been the liquid CO2 carriers. Um, this is uh, the carbon capture and storage market is a huge market. Uh, it's a nascent market that within the next five years it's going to blow up. We're talking about just in Western Europe about 60 to 100 MTPA. So this is a very, very significant market. Right now, there are a number of projects that are being materialized or are taking FID, and this is going to blow up um, um, between somewhere between 2027 and 2030. The thing is that, again, going to my original point, there is very li limited CPR capacity, and especially for specialized ships. Um, so there is one subcontractor in Korea that can build bilobe um, uh, tanks of the, of the strength of metal that is needed for liquid CO2 carriers, and they have said so far they can build four ships of that type per year. So, and we are talking probably of, of dozens of ships that are going to be needed by 2030. So these are the two are bifurcated strategies. So investing in dual fuel ships uh, today and LNG carriers, as well as vessels that are going to be needed in the future. But of course, uh, the proof is in the pudding. Thank you. We believe in, uh, in ammonia as well. So we're building uh, si similar ships, but uh, well done. Uh, Leon, uh, after you've sold uh, all the tankers at good prices, we also see you investing in um, new builds. Uh, can you also tell us a few, a few words? Good morning, everyone. My name is uh, Leon Patitsas, Atlas Maritime. Uh, we, in the last three years, since uh, November 2020, we've ordered 17 uh, new buildings worth $1.3 billion, most of them tankers and uh, also for PCTCs, car carriers. So we believed in um, uh, investing in new ships, new technologies. The car carriers are LNG dual fuel. And of course, uh, we sold all the older vessels that we had, 11 uh, ships. And um, the reason we did that, of course, is that we saw values appreciating substantially on the tanker side. So we have a strict discipline when we see that um, we can double our money, uh, we believe it's a good time to take some chips off the table and reinvest in uh, new buildings. So I would uh, suggest um, for everyone that is looking to invest in shipping, tankers, of course, when we ordered them back in 2020, they were a 20 year historical low. Now they have appreciated substantially, but still the order book is really low. It's around four or five percent of um, the fleet. And the average age of the fleet is also very old. So if you look at uh, shipbuilding capacity, it's limited and uh, shipbuilding values are going up. There's a lot of uncertainty about, you know, the next uh, fuel and propulsion. So people are reluctant to order new ships. And um, what we've seen in the tanker market is uh, in the summer it was really weak and we saw rates in the teens. But as soon as um, the Middle Eastern conflict unfolded, we saw rates uh, doubling almost. So that proves that the market is very tight. All the charters, all the oil majors and the traders, they are scrambling to secure supply of cargoes. And what that means is they need to book ships. And um, we think, you know, oil demand is pretty healthy. Oil production in the United States is firing on all cylinders, 13 million barrels per day, and they're gonna continue to export more. We saw that uh, the US is now easing sanctions on Venezuela, so there's gonna be additional supply from Venezuela, from Brazil, West Africa, and there will be added pressure on the Middle East and the Saudis to increase production next year. So we think that uh, this uncertainty in the Middle East will be very positive for tankers. Uh, the US is doing everything they can with their diplomacy to ensure that this um, war doesn't spread to other fronts. And nobody wants actually the war to escalate because what would that mean is of course, a humanitarian crisis, but also a price shock on the price of oil. The price of oil might go to 150. And this is, of course, very negative for the world economy. It's very negative for inflation, and it will be negative for the US elections as well. 
So the U.S. wants the price of oil low. So we think that um, more oil is going to be coming into the market, and uh, it's going to be positive for tankers. And then on the car carrier front, we invested in uh, car carriers because they suffered for approximately a decade. They were in crisis. Nobody built any ships. And uh, they scrapped all the older vessels. And we saw an opportunity there. We studied the fundamentals, and we thought it was um, a good investment, especially in LNG dual fuel car carriers that can transport 7,000 electric cars. Most of the electric cars are being built now in China, as well as uh, Korea and Japan. And there is a huge uh, growth potential for electric cars being exported to Europe and the United States. So I would suggest uh, for anyone you know, to look into tankers as well as car carriers. Thank you. Thank you. I hope we don't have too many electric cars because that will be bad for tankers, right? <laughs> Absolutely. And it was a good hedge for us since we have uh, the oil uh, tanker exposure. It was a good hedge to go into car carriers with the electric cars. Uh, Elias, if you can have your, your views as well. Sure. Uh, so, first of all, I will echo uh, a lot of these messages. It is a very, very difficult environment to invest in shipping. Uh, asset, asset prices are high and uh, way above their mid-cycle levels from a historical perspective. There's no doubt about, about that. We also need to, to remember that for the better part of a decade, if you compared uh, shipping to any other uh, major asset class, it was inexpensive. And that's not the case anymore from a relative value perspective either. And so given where both treasuries are, guilds or, what, or whatever else, also waiting and being patient is not as painful as it would have been otherwise. Having said that, on a relative basis, um, one of the things that sticks out, has been sticking out, uh, at least in our opinion, for the last couple of years, and will probably continue to do that, is the dislocation in the oil market. Uh, we do agree with what Leon said in terms of the tra tra trans transportation of oil. But actually, if you go further upstream, we do believe that, albeit the world is moving to a greener future, the next 5, 10, 15 years are short oil and gas. And uh, that goes all the way back to the production and the generation of these resources. And so um, uh, 18 months ago, a couple of years ago, we started to invest in offshore. Uh, we rotated out of uh, container ships and other segments that we were in, and we started to invest in offshore. It was probably the only shipping segment at the time that one could still call uh, distressed. Um, uh, we were purchasing these vessels from banks and other uh, players which who were in bankruptcy. Um, and obviously, uh, all the ge ge geopolitical situation helped. There, there, there's no doubt about that in terms of accelerating that thesis. Now, in today's world, obviously, this is no longer the play, uh, the, uh, the, the case, and these uh, pr prices are no longer uh, distressed. Having said that, they're probably still um, the most attractive second-hand prices uh, when you compare them to uh, replacement costs. And talking about supply, this is one segment where there is zero supply, literally zero supply. There, there is no order book, uh, and there, it's very, very unlikely that there will be one. And so if you believe uh, what I said earlier about the tailwinds of the end demand over the next five and ten years, and there will be ups and downs, then that will probably be one segment that will will continue to uh, to do quite well, and the proof is in the pudding. And one of the things that is encouraging to see uh, this has traditionally, at least in the Western world, being a very spot-oriented market for or platform supply vessels or, or anchor handlers. Uh, while it was always a uh, term market, especially in the Middle East or Latin America. Now you're actually seeing even the Northern European markets offering term uh, term contracts as the operators are seeing this uh, uh, this squeeze that's coming. Uh, thank you, Elias. As uh, some people are not familiar with uh, Borealis, can you say a few things about the company? Sure. 
Um, so we are slightly different to, to the rest of the companies on this panel. We are an investment and asset manager, which means that we are raising institutional uh, capital in private form, uh, mainly from the US, and uh, we invest it across the maritime space. Um, not only across uh, but in, in, in terms of buying vessels, which we do a lot of, but also investing across the capital structure. So we also are a, an alternative lender uh, to, the, to the shipping industry. And that gives us an extra uh, flexibility, if you like. And currently, how many vessels do you have? So on the, uh, so we started, just to give you some perspective, 18 months ago, we had 80, ve 80 owned vessels and uh, probably 60 uh, finance vessels. Today we're down to 30 owned vessels and 120 finance vessels. Well done. Uh, okay, new question. Um, lately with the very high, uh, interest rates, we hear from banks that there's a lot of uh, deleveraging and uh, people uh, that have made good money over the last uh, two years in containers and tankers uh, prepaying their loans. It's, um, it's something that we hear, we hear quite a lot. So uh, what is your uh, view, Petros, of uh, further growth uh, versus uh, deleveraging? Or, of course, some, some people can, can do both at the same time. Well, when uh, you asked me previously where I would invest, I would probably not invest anywhere right now. So uh, if we had additional money and as uh, interest rates are up, uh, and I think they will probably hold there for a while, I would probably uh, use extra cash to do leverage. And especially for public companies, um, our shareholders like it that we do not have very high leverage. So for now, I would probably uh, repay loans or I would engage in buybacks, especially if um, we trade under an, uh, net asset value. Um, and yeah, and that springs from the fact that uh, we don't really see uh, investment opportunities that would give us a, a great IRR on the dry side right now. Thank you. Yanis? Well, as far as deleverage, I don't think we can go any further. <laughs> uh, we are, uh, practically, we are, you know, I mean, net zero already. And uh, all the projects that we are doing, new buildings and whatever and uh, the uh, our recent let's say investment in the dry bulk market uh, are purely just uh, absorbing our generated uh, you know cash flow so uh, I, I agree it's not the time you know to take uh, risks with interest we don't know how long they're gonna be there uh, Everybody, uh, you, you know, has uh, mistimed the uh, the development of interest rates. We have seen the, the bond market collapsed, uh, you know, for the first time in history into such a degree. And uh, I think that, you know, as I said, it's a time for prudence because you know, with interest rates, uh, practically when you take into account uh, spreads in the region of eight, nine percent, uh, it's nothing like the previous decade. Yeah, I would agree and uh, we're doing the, the same thing. Uh, Jerry? Oh, absolutely agree. I think it's a sign of the times and uh, the uncertainty that we were discussing yeah. earlier. So. Um, I think if you ask um, the, the banks that are present here and the financial institutions, they will tell you that they have seen uh, record level of repayments um, uh, last year and the year before that. And um, there is also reluctance uh, to, uh, to take on bigger projects. So I think this is a common uh, theme, if you want, uh, across um, every uh, ship owner. 
for us, I mean, we this is also the traditional uh, Greek uh, sipping, right? I mean, um, low leverage um, is uh, what maintains you through the, the cycles. This is what we always had. Um, but I think in this uh, cycle, we have taken advantage of um, the great, especially container and tanker markets, to be honest, uh, to take on some extra liquidity um, and uh, pay down uh, debt, as now the opportunity cost uh, uh, hurdle has risen uh, quite a bit. Correct, and uh, also there's a big risk for, from the banks because the banks are all chasing the top 20, top 20 owners and uh, the majority of these owners do not want uh, to take debt at these levels so don't need to take debt at these levels and uh, the banks have two choices. One is uh, uh, have their portfolios uh, being reduced or uh, lend to second tier owners with the associated risks. So it's uh, quite a difficult uh, decision. Uh, Leon? It's always good to have uh, moderate leverage and have a financial buffer or a war chest to weather out the downturn. <clears throat> you never know what's going to hit you. you. There are always black swan events like. Um, uh, 1998, the Russian crisis, 97, the Asian crisis, 2008, the world financial crisis, now the pandemic. So everybody must be prepared for the worst and uh, ensure that uh, you have um, enough uh, financial strength to weather out the storm. I always like a story from uh, the 80s. There was a famous uh, ship owner, CM Lemos, and he had a big fleet of ships in the middle of the crisis in 1983, he probably had 50 or 60 ships laid up in Piraeus and they were not earning any money. So a young uh, broker asked him, I said, Mr. Lemos, uh, with this market being so terrible, how long do you think you can sustain yourself? So he said, according to my latest calculation, 450 years. <laughs> so, <laughs> so if you can uh, weather out uh, the storm and have, um, cast on the sidelines to maybe take advantage of opportunities. Uh, this is uh, the best strategy going forward. Elias? Thank you. Uh, yeah, I don't have a lot to add. We also have um, uh, reduced our, our leverage. In fact, uh, our fleet is entirely unlevered at the moment. We do agree that it's good to have, uh, even if it costs you something, it's good to have a war chest ready uh, when the market is there uh, to uh, facilitate acquisitions. Even if you have to pay some commitment fees, that's, uh, for us, that's a cost we're worth bearing. But otherwise, uh, the fleet itself at the moment is yeah, completely unlevered. How much time we have, Kevin? Okay. Uh, okay, let's go to something more, uh, more recent. Uh, what about the conflict of uh, I in uh, Israel? Uh, what do you think it's going to become worse? It's going to, it's going to, let's say, slowly calm down. Is it going to be good or bad for our business, uh, Petros? Yeah, geopolitics is very close. I mean, it affects shipping for sure. Um, I'm afraid that if um, if uh, Israel decides to uh, get into Gaza, I think this may have um, worldwide uh, repercussions. Uh, in a way, good thing is that the Americans are there and uh, perhaps uh, Iran will not get involved in this. If it does, I don't know where it's going to go. Um, usually, all these bad things for some weird reason, uh, are good for shipping. Um, uh, I don't know if that is going to be um, as important as in whether it's going to affect. Definitely, will it will have an effect on uh, on oil prices. Uh, somebody mentioned uh, 150 dollars uh, earlier. That's not uh, improbable. Um, the good thing about shipping will be that vessels will slow down speed, so supply will be reduced, but uh, uh, at what cost, at what carnage? So uh, I hope that this doesn't escalate. 
irrespective of where it's going to lead uh, the shipping world. Um, so, you know, but I don't think anybody can foresee uh, the after effects. Yanni? Well, uh, I was in Tel Aviv just about three, four weeks ago for, you know, to attend uh, an invitation. And uh, I could never imagine, you know, that four weeks later something like that would happen. Uh, people over there were, in general, pretty content with the situation. Uh, we even went to Jerusalem and everything looked seemingly peaceful. Uh, it's, it's an event, yes, I agree that it's unpredictable uh, in terms of, you know, what will happen. Uh, however, to me, uh, it is uh, more, uh, let's say, a group that the Palestinians wanted to do to uh, wake up the international community in the Palestinian problem, which was forgotten uh, in the midst of other events, the Ukrainian world, war, and uh, all the decarbonization issues, which are, uh, you know, very much into the politicians' heads, but that issue had been, uh, let's say, neglected. And uh, that was a wake-up call. Uh, yeah, I hope that it doesn't uh, really uh, escalate. On the other hand, uh, we have seen that markets today are relatively efficient. You may have a uh, few spikes, but in the long run, they can adjust much better than they did, for example, you know, back in 1973 or other periods of time. On the other hand, now we have the, the US as a net exporter of oil. So all that uh, is a stabilizing uh, factor. Jerry? I think what we have been getting used to over the last uh, couple of years that is waking up one day and seeing this kind of tragic events unfold, uh, and especially so close to us, uh, kind of um, seems to, uh, to signify a new era. Uh, we haven't been used to this type of geopolitical um, um, events, uh, again, especially so close at, uh, to home um, and of, at that scale. I mean, um, the Middle East has been always volatile, but now what we're seeing uh, seems to be um, it seems to bring the whole of Middle East to the brink of uh, a more wider uh, conflict. Um, so setting the humanitarian um, tragedy aside, um, there is the common wisdom that geopolitic, geopolitical volatility tends to be um, um, good for shipping, and I think that in this case, higher energy prices, uh, which we will almost certainly see unless things de-escalate very quickly, um, should be uh, good for, um, uh, for the tanker business. I would also add the LNG business. Uh, as um, um, tank oil prices go up, um, the switch to, uh, to LNG will become, uh, um, to natural gas and LNG will become more attractive. This is uh, typically a commodity that trades uh, at um, a certain percent percentage of uh, oil prices. Um, so um, I think that um, um, that shipping segment should do also quite well. The I think what I fear is more the after effects. That is what happens uh, after uh, we see a, a conflict like this, if it, if it becomes a more a wider conflict, because typically uh, very high energy prices would affect uh, economic growth globally, and that uh, medium to long term would affect also demand for uh, for shipping. But uh, let, let's see how things unfold. As uh, um, I think it's quite quite difficult to say at this point. Uh, Leon, uh, uh, one minute, please, each, as we are running out of time. Go ahead. Sure. So we saw that um, Iran is uh, threatening, and they're saying that uh, time for diplomacy is running out, and they're threatening that they will close the Straits of Hormuz. Of course, 20 million barrels of oil are flowing through the Straits 
every day. So this would have a huge impact on the tanker market as well as the oil market. Uh, and we also saw that the US is now sanctioning some ships that are engaged in Russian or Iranian trade. So the US will turn the screws and this will be negative, of course, for whoever is in the dark fleet and is trading Russia or Iran, but it will be positive for all the Europeans that are trading in the West and um, are in legitimate trades. So uh, we hope that uh, the situation uh, will become much better and the war will not spread and this uh, will be good for everyone. Elias, one final comment. So just to try to uh, loop, loop back to the first question, it's one of the key, key reasons, obviously, why uh, pa patience may be a virtue in today's environment. Uh, what's happening in the Middle East at the moment is terrible. Uh, there is uh, high risk of esca uh, you know, escalation. Uh, the war in the Ukraine is not over. And these are not the only uh, ge ge geopolitical risks that we are all reading about every day. There are others which are f uh, you know, further east and there are others which are elsewhere. And so it's very, very difficult to read at the moment. And uh, yes, o obviously, as long as it's not catastrophic, uh, ge ge geopolitical risks are very, very helpful for shipping because they place cargo uh, security above cargo efficiency. And, uh, and so, uh, but as human beings, obviously, uh, you wish for something different. <coughs> Thank you all very much for your uh, input.